don't get me wrong, I'm very patriotic. I love my country. But game, there's there's a lot of disasters along the way. You have real failures. You know, you have to keep failing in order to learn. Imagine you've spent your career, you're 61 years old like me, and you've spent your career in Canada. All right, Dominic. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, so we met, what, two years ago at this point? Yeah, easily and two years now, yeah. The way that we met was kind of interesting. You saw one of my ads from the marketing company, and I think you went on through Instagram. Our, on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. You went through our funnel. Yeah. And we went and had dinner. Right. And I distinctly remember that being a pivotal moment within my career because it was the first time that I had attracted the uh, interest or attention of someone who had a solidified background within investment banking and uh, took notice to the system that we had set up and uh, moreover, the viability of what we were doing. And I think after that, we did a series of, I don't know, three or four deals together. Yeah. And we were quite successful with those. And um, I mean, here we are today, we're running a firm. We set it up only two months ago and we're at a position now where we've, we've done our first transaction. It was our first deal. Yeah. A spectacular one. <laughs> yeah. So I, I certainly want I, to speak. Actually, I have to say, biggest deal of my life, to really? be honest. Yeah. I've never done anything Not even that the, large. Even the BlackRock deal? No, that was, um, well, that wasn't me. That was IA Securities, and that was my partner, Jared Bodie, and I assisted with that. I worked on that file. But, but one um, that you were directly... One that I was directly responsible yeah. for. This was pretty stupendous, $125 million. Yeah. Uh, and to have that money raised so quickly with a pretty ecstatic client. In three weeks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a great, great system. And also, serendipitously, the client... Just so happened to live three floors above me. <laughs> and he ended up going to dinner yeah. with him and we realized right. pretty quickly, okay, you know what? I'm going to see this guy in the elevator. Yeah. We better get this one done. And, and speaking of serendipitous, the client also knew the buyer, the, the, yeah. the fund that we found that was interested in that financing. Yeah. You yeah. know, I think anyone who says that luck isn't a big part of the equation is maybe a little bit misguided. Is, is so wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the preparation meeting. The Although there's something to be said for making your own luck too, right? Yeah. Like, you know, um, we put in a lot of hard work to get to that point. We had 10 or 12 people responding um, to our solicitations, but uh, or the company's solicitations. We don't make the solicitations, the company does. But um, yeah, with that amount of people responding, uh, we we're bound to get somebody. And it just so happened that the the biggest fish in the pond knew Greg, yeah, the CEO of the the issuer. So let's let's take it back uh, to the beginning. I'd love to hear about your your background, your experience, what led you to this point. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, because I mean, you essentially came out of retirement to to yeah. to start this this firm up again. Yeah, I mean, I've you know I've always grown up in Vancouver. I grew up at went to St. George's, played rugby, went to UBC, played more rugby. Started with Scotia McLeod as a retail salesman and learned uh, sales from the ground up that way. Um, it wasn't until about the year 2000 that I figured, you know, there's just something, it, it wasn't fulfilling for me to, to be managing money for people. I, I wasn't enjoying it. And when Terry Salmon left Nesbitt Burns, where I was working at the time, to start Salmon Partners, I went with him and started on his institutional sales desk. And honestly, that, that was a revelation. I worked with a gentleman by the name of Sam McGee there who was a brilliant salesman, uh, but he was a candle who burned fast and unfortunately Sam passed away, uh, boy, close to 15 years ago now. Um, but I learned a lot from Sam and I, since then I joined uh, Canaccord uh, and worked in Calgary for them and I had great years in Calgary. Yeah. Back when oil was trading to $150 and we were seed financing companies like Athabasca Oil Sands and Canacol. Um, and I always worked on small companies and startups because it's what I enjoyed. I enjoyed getting an equity position. I felt like you could really make a difference in that space. And I enjoyed working on the company and seeing something go from, from nothing to something. And that was really fun. So uh, the best years in Calgary were, you know, Canaccord and Macquarie were fantastic companies to work for. 
I would have stayed at Macquarie forever. Unfortunately, Macquarie sold uh, to the Richardson family, which changed changed everything. <clears throat> From there, I went to IA Securities and finished off my career there. I was there about seven years and uh, quit about three years ago, retired to Bowen Island. And I wasn't really doing much until you and I sort of reunited. Yeah. Basically, I've really been enjoying what we're doing. Yeah. Merchant banking effectively is what we're doing now. There's a big difference between that and investment banking. Yeah, I, I like it. I appreciate you you doing this. I think um I think the best years are to come. I think the heyday is here. I mean you had your heyday in Calgary. Yeah. I love hearing the stories. Yeah. I think it'd be good to talk a little bit about that. Maybe you yeah, could sure. dive into some of the you know, talk about Athabasca, talk about Bulldog. You know, I was I was really lucky. I had a good mentor there, um, Rick Grafton, who uh, was head of the energy desk at Canaccord, and he introduced me to everybody. And to be honest, that was so important to have somebody that would introduce you not only to the issuers, but essentially some of the funds and the people could make that happen for you. One of the things you want to do when you're a registered broker, <clears throat> excuse me, is always try and 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 control those clients and, and be in front of those clients. And it's stepping back from that business now, I, I recognize that that was the wrong way to do things. Mm -hmm. The smartest people in this industry are the people who are unregistered, who are paying the brokers to go out and raise capital for them. One guy that I liken that to is Alex Wiley, who was a former investment banker himself. He's now the CEO and president of Volt Lithium, which I'm a significant shareholder of. And um, Alex is brilliant at mobilizing groups to help him, um, you know, bankers, uh, salesmen, influencers, people like that. And he's, he's been very successful as a result of it. But to get back to Calgary, you know, I think one of the most exciting stories was Canacall. Um, I had some good information. I knew about uh, the president and who he was. I knew about the assets. And I think I was able to move very quickly as a result of that and buy up stock at seven, eight cents. And then I took more stock at 12 cents when they did the financing. And that was a tremendous win for me, obviously, as a result of that. And Canacall went to $7 over the next few years. Uh, I wish I'd stayed till seven. I didn't. I, I stayed till about four, but uh, it was mm -hmm. still great. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part, too, when you're, you're sitting in in the retail seat or the institutional seat is getting your clients to keep the stock. You might believe in the story, but your clients, they don't. They see something they've already got a multi-bagger in 10, 20 times their money. And they're like, I'd be crazy not to sell. And so you try and compromise and tell them to, uh, you know, to take out enough to cover their cost. And they're like, no, I need to sell. And who am I to argue if they've got that great a win, they should yeah. sell. I should mention too, you know, in this game, there's there's a lot of disasters along the way. You have real, real failures and failures are just another way to learn. You know, you have to keep failing in order to learn. And when you do fail, uh, it's inevitable that there's going to be a big success story around the corner. One of my smartest clients in New York used to say, Honestly, in this business, you come up with 10 ideas, nine of them don't work. The one that works pays for all of them. I don't think it was that dramatic. You know, I like to think I had a better track record than that, but I would say at least 40% of them don't work for the average person. Um, it's the power law. Right? It, it is. You, yeah. So venture capital bases all of their yeah. investments off of it. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess... Just some basic rules for anybody who's interested in this, you know, try and pick the best management teams you can possibly find. I'd much rather have lousy assets and a great management team than anything else. That great management team will take lousy assets and create something. Whereas somebody with great assets and a lousy management team will destroy it. Mm -hmm. And those assets will eventually be, they'll end up in the home they belong in, in the hands of a good custodian. So... There's that, and also make sure companies are well capitalized. A lot of people underestimate um, structure and the capitalization of a company. You've got to be sure that these little companies, little startups, are always uh, well capitalized. But something I'd like to talk about is your idea of financing funds. Mm. I've never done that before. 
And I think it's a brilliant idea because, you know, we're, we're talking to these funds that have been in business lately for the past 10, 20 years, they've got $6 billion under management and they still feel there's potential clients for them in North America. You know, if they come from Europe, for instance, mm -hmm. and, uh, helping to build those is something I'm really interested in. I think that that's a really good direction for Cadenwood where we become, you know, facilitators, marketers, representatives of those funds. Well, I always try to think in terms of my skill set, the skill set of the people that I have around me and using that skill set, what the greatest leverage we can have in the marketplace is. Mm -hmm. So you can think of this in terms of how high up in the marketplace can you go? What's the highest caliber of client can you service with the existing skill set that you have? Mm -hmm. And I'm always trying to view things in, in, in that or through that prism. And it just, it makes sense because you do the same amount of work as you would for a company like say Aja. In some cases you do even more work, but you end up getting outsized return on whatever time you've invested right? and, and leverage on the skills that you have mm -hmm. because you do the same amount of work. I mean, to finance a $5 million deal or to finance a billion dollar deal at the end of the day, the work is still the same. Yeah, you're right. It, it's the same amount of hours you're going to be putting in. Yeah. Everyone has the same amount of hours in a day. Mm -hmm. So what do you have? The leverage of the opportunity, the leverage of the client. Yeah. That's, that's the difference, right? That's what makes a great firm from a, you know, a mediocre firm. But I think what, what prevents a lot of people from doing that is either they, they don't think that they themselves are capable or perhaps they think that they don't have the right relationships or the right network. Mm. or they're just conditioned to think small and think that, oh, you know, that's not my space. I'm not going to be doing that. You know, it doesn't even necessarily go for the capital advisory business. I mean, that, that goes for anything. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important thing that has always served me well. But of course, you have to match that with your skill set. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to go and, you know, I'm going to, advise governments if you don't have yeah. the capability yeah, yeah. of doing that. But, you know, um, anyway, that's the, that's the thought process behind it. And I think with, you know, some of the people that we're bringing onto the team now, like Mike, Nay, Nikita, they all have a very vast network, longstanding relationships with these LPs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just, you know, us doing that regular program that we would with the emails. It's, Hey, here's this fund. Who do you know that would have appetite for this? Make some phone calls. Yeah. And that's a far greater story. And you couple that with all of the investor relations that we're doing as well. I think in the next couple of years, we could very well be one of the go-to boutique capital uh, placement agents in the world because mm -hmm. the word on the street is, and you know, not to be disparaging, but I think a lot of people within this space are complacent because things have, you know, there's the status quo and things have been done a certain way for decades and people kind of just come into the business and that's what they learn. And they, you know, the, I think coming from an entrepreneurial background, coming from a marketing background, I can see things with a new light, but to, to touch on what I was saying, to finish my thought, um, I have friends of mine who are doing something similar. And they say all of their clients uh, say we completely blow the placement agents that are on the market out of the water because they're complacent. They they like their upfront fees. They think take think they think that things take eons to complete. They only have several people that they bring the deals to. But you know, if you have the robust network, you have the entrepreneurial spirit, you have that you know drive, and you combine all the capabilities together you have something that can be incredibly valuable to the market. Yeah. It's the ability to turn over every rock on the beach until you find that gem. Exactly. And then you introduce a bit of luck. Yeah. But a serendipity. Do you know, too, if you think about it from a leverage standpoint for a traditional investment bank, raising money for a fund doesn't make much work or doesn't make much sense. Right. Their, their biggest issue is going to be that is just too much work. 
We're not going to call institutions. You'd be better off hiring one individual at the firm to be yeah. able to do that. And that's an overwhelming task for that individual, by the way, if they're an investor relations person or whatever their position is, head of sales. Um, you've got to be able to branch out and, and find those funds. And, and you've got to think internationally. You've got to be able to look for those funds in different countries, right? Mm -hmm. find where you're going to find them. You just don't know. You don't know until you, you run a scan properly. That's one thing I've learned working with you. Mm -hmm. What would you say is from your experience, the biggest differentiation between the, the way that we approach this business and the way that you had previously or oh, yeah. the way that other people yeah, within yeah. this industry approach yeah. the First service all, delivery, you know? Because of the compliance regulations in the investment banking industry, a lot of um, bankers are uh, pretty much regulated to their backyard. So you've got a salesman out west in Canada and he covers Calgary and Vancouver, or maybe you've got a guy covering Calgary, a guy covering Vancouver. And then you've got uh, a team in Toronto where the so-called hub is. Canada is so small in a global financial perspective. They're pro you know, I could probably count on on both hands the amount of major hedge funds or hedge funds that are involved in There's Canada. There's only a handful. And, it's, and they don't have a lot of capital. Yeah. Most of them have less than a billion dollars. There's a couple out there with, you know, $2 billion. But the market here is so small that they can't afford to have more than $2 billion because their performance goes down. Right. So then you look at that desk and let's say it's a mid-size independent firm that handles small cap companies. You've probably got six or seven salespeople Three of them, four of them even might be mining specialists because that's what we do in Canada. We pull things out of the ground and we sell it offshore. Um, you know, one of them might be a tech specialist. One might be focused on forestry. Uh, one might be an oil and gas guy. If you come in with a special situation of some sort, there's really no desk in Canada that can really handle that well. There's desks that can handle it and they do a good job but they don't handle it well. And part of the problem too is if you're a junior company and this is the, the worst thing the, that's going on right now, um, what the hedge funds will do is they'll basically give you the, the capital you need for your company. They'll say, give you $6 million or whatever the amount is that you need. Um, but they'll ask you for a warrant attached to that. It's a mm -hmm. half a warrant. And guess what? They're out there shorting your stock while you're promoting it. <laughs> And the next thing you know, you've got uh, everybody owning nothing and none of them own any of your stock and they've just got their warrant for free. There's a lot of hedge funds that are actually um, that way inclined. Uh, there's two or three that I know of uh, that are pretty good at holding their stock and are genuine investors. But that's a real problem for junior companies in Canada. And it's a, I get it from the banker's perspective. It's that's how they're going to get their capital, mm -hmm. right? You know, so unless you're getting the money from retail, which from a compliance perspective is risky too, I'd rather sell to sophisticated investors. Most people would. Yeah. So those clients are sophisticated, but there's a toll. It's a tough place. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing at Cadenwood with family offices in the U.S., sophisticated investors talking to PMs, you know, some of them have a great affinity for these startups because their family has had multiple startup experiences and they understand it. So they attract, you know, they, they can offer capital for things like that if it's the right type of scenario. And for them to write a check for five, 10 million, really not a problem. Then you get into the problem of, you know, you need uh, more distribution in your cap structure. You've got to have a thousand people with very small positions and then you can have this one big supporting investor but you can't have them over 10 percent or even you know 20 percent or any number like that they've got to remain a reasonable position within the cap structure that's the biggest problem with micro cap companies in canada right now that's what they're facing um, which is another reason i really like working in the united states bigger companies you know stronger cap structure, you're able to take on bigger investors, uh, and working models, models like they're already up and running, producing cash flow, companies that have been in revenue for a while, you know, they've proven something. Um, Drisha is a really good example. 
uh, ex Goldman Sachs team puts together a, a wonder software program that can really help oil and gas companies. They've got a couple of big, big oil companies, the Exxon's of the world, you know, has already hired them, uh, the integrateds, right? Um, in fact, I think they've got 13 clients now from that world. Yeah, they do. So impressive, right? And they were already generating revenue. They've only been in business. I think they've had their shingle open for about a year. Uh, high margin business, very lucrative, recurring revenue. That's the type of thing we want to be working on uh, when we're not working on the funds. You know, I think that's also another distinct advantage that we have is our set of capabilities while being such a small firm. I mean, we can do M&A, we can do debt advisory, we can do equity, we can do strategic advisory, do the merchant banking side where we incubate companies like Tricia. Mm -hmm. There's so many different things that we can do. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, I like to think of Cadenwood, and I think we titled ourselves as a merchant bank. We put our own capital into things before we work on it. Um, we refer to uh, investment banks and other ju junior entities if they're needed. Um, and we basically introduce our issuers to clients, clients who can buy their, their stock, clients who can finance them, right? So I think that's a very clever place to be. Um, takes away a lot of the compliance issues. We're good at marketing. That's our strength. Mm -hmm. Institutional sales has been my forte for decades. It's where to be. So where do you see this five years down the road? You know, I've been thinking about that the last couple of weeks, and, and I think the most important thing for us is to stay in this realm um, as an unregistered merchant bank focused on taking seed positions in potential companies. I would love to dig our noses into the fund world a little bit more, learn about who buys those funds, uh, whether it be the pension funds, foundations, sovereign wealth corporations, whoever it may be, I'd like to find out how we can get those big ticket orders, a hundred million dollars, uh, you know, maybe over time, raise a billion dollars for a fund. And once we've learned that, then I'd like to help smaller funds, guys who are just starting out, guys with a five-year track record who've got a great return, who have a, a niche product of some sort that fits into a pension fund uh, that's got a very low risk structure. There's people like that out there. Um, I think that's where Nay can bring a lot of value because, I mean, his network of family offices along with ours, we can open up that emerging side of the and, and market. Mike, Mike too, Mark, especially Mike given well. his location and living in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's, uh, Mike's been great at bringing some of those names. And, and but then we also have the capability of working with the larger ones. I mean, AIP is a great example of that, what we were capable of doing with them in, in three weeks, really. Like yeah. we, from the time of us having that dinner with Greg to us getting Plymouth on the phone, and then saying what they're in well, and, three weeks. You know, the other thing that was nice about AIP was that all of the hard work, the uh, administrative work, the prepar preparatory work, the prospectus work, all of that stuff had before, already yeah. been done yeah. uh, over the past two years as they were trying to get that company financed in a tough environment. Um, we just happened to help them uh, find the right. Well, just it goes to say, right? Like there's a, there's a, there's a saying in marketing, like the, the offer sells itself, right? Whatever you're offering to the marketplace is what actually determines whether you're going to make any money with it or not. So if you spend most of your time creating the offer, yeah, doing the marketing is easy, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it's the same thing here. If you have mm -hmm. something that's a good product, mm -hmm. it's a good offer to the marketplace because at the end of the day, that that's what it is. You're you're just marketing a, an equity product to investors. Yeah, that's all it is, right? It's an equity or debt product. So if it's a good if it's a good offer, yeah, it's going to be easy for you to get attention and, and interest for it. Absolutely. The difficult piece is when you have companies that don't have all of that structural, strategic side or piece put together, and they don't really have the right go to market strategy. They don't really have the right positioning or story that's compelling. Mm -hmm. All of that goes into the offer. So if they don't have that, then the, the marketing can be quite difficult, right? So all of it's sort of predicated on them having that in place, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things with AIP, for instance, was, you know, 
just getting their story out to a few sophisticated real estate investors. Mm. They had never done that. You know, they'd kind of relied on word of mouth and, and friends that they were close to. Uh, but getting out to a few select, well-targeted names really helped. Just goes to show you, you know? Yeah. Goes to show you the power of the system that we've built. Because it's it's all encompassing. It's, you know, portion traditional placement work based on relationships. Mm -hmm. And then there's the marketing piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that put together is something that's going to be our our advantage and i think that's what's going to enable us to become one, one of the the top premier boutique firms mm -hmm. not just in north america but i think in the world yeah it's an exciting prospect mm -hmm. so do you think you're ever going to leave canada <laughs> uh so i've looked at you know some of the issues surrounding that because um you know my feelings about the liberal government and uh, you know, I've done everything I can to help Polyev. And I, I honestly believe that um, we're gonna get him as our next prime minister, which I, I think, think so. is going to help. Uh, I, you know, part of the issue with moving to the States, for instance, and it's, it's a great place to be, it's a great country. My son's going to university there. Um, it's wonderful, but they have this estate tax. So imagine you've spent your career, you're 61 years old like me, and you've spent your career in Canada and you've paid 20%, 33% in capital gains tax the whole way. And you've paid 54% in regular taxes. And then you've paid your GST and your PST, and then you've paid your luxury taxes. You've paid your real estate taxes and whatever else other, now we're getting a carbon tax you know, all of that has been paid for. And don't get me wrong, I'm very patriotic. I love my country. But the biggest issue is if I go to the States and I sell off some of my capital gains, I'm all of a sudden faced with an estate tax when I die of 45% on just about everything. Um, plus, if Kamala gets in, she's talking about a 45% capital gains tax. They have apparently an exemption up to 11 million, um, but uh, boy, it's a tough one. It's a really tough one. So yeah, the, I guess the long and short of it is I'm going to stay right here for now and see if Polyev gets in and see if he changes a few things. I think you will. I think Europe long term is the goal for me. Right? Yeah. Nice place to live. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful spot. Keep the home plate, the home base here, though. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's go have some dinner. I would love that. <laughs> Sounds good.